Hi everyone, my name is Tom Barry and I'm here at the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Garden City, New York, built on the site of and in the hangar of Mitchell Field, a former Air Force base. Now, we are excited today to do this program for New York State uh, Pathways Through History, the weekend event. And today we're going to take you through 100 years of aviation in our galleries. We have over 75 air and spacecraft, and I can't wait to show them to you. Our first gallery is called A Dream of Wings, and it covers the history before 1903, before the Wright Brothers' first flight. And that's a lot of history. So we're talking going all the way from ancient times when people were just dreaming about flying, thinking of putting feathers on wings on their arms, through the invention of kites, hot air balloons, airships, gliders, when people were figuring out step by step what they needed to do to achieve a flight that is sustained and controllable. Let's check it out. When Alexander Graham Bell wasn't inventing telephones, you may have found him tinkering a little bit in aeronautics. In fact, he built this kite that's above me here. It's a tetrahedral kite, and this was able to generate a great deal of lift, one of the fundamental forces of flight. Now, kites generated a whole lot of lift, but they also generated a whole lot of drag, and it's really hard to travel places when you have a whole lot of drag. So, we needed a design that could create lift while minimizing that drag. Gliders, like this Lilienthal glider up here, had wings that could generate lift, but didn't have so much of that backwards force drag. Now, the only American to purchase a Lilienthal glider was William Randolph Hearst. He thought that the interest in flight would help him sell newspapers. So, up at Sands Point, he bought one, and they flew it. Not William Randolph Hearst himself. He had one of his employees fly it. That is called delegation. In 1903, everything came together. Down in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, two bicycle makers from Ohio had the first controlled, sustained, heavier-than-air flight. This happened in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The first flight lasted a grand total of 12 seconds. By the end of the day, they got better at it. You can definitely say that Kitty Hawk, North Carolina is the birthplace of aviation. And my birthplace was a hospital. That's not where I grew up, not where I matured. Well, sort of. For me, that happened at home. For aviation, that happened right here on Long Island. That's why this museum isn't called the birthplace of aviation. It's called the cradle of aviation. This is the Golden Flyer, the first airplane to fly over Long Island. Now, the original Golden Flyer crashed. It's gone. So this is a replica built from the original plans. The Wright brothers, after their first flight, they were so scared that people were going to steal their ideas, infringe on them, that they didn't do any public flights. Glenn Curtis had no issue with that. So he flew over the skies in Hammondsport, where he was from, but then he decided that Hemsport was not the best place to take off and land. Lake, mountain, swamp, not the best place for airplanes that need a whole lot of space. So he searched around and found the largest prairie east of the Allegheny Mountains, right here on Long Island. So that's where he set up shop. Now, his flight was just one of many seminal flights that took off from Long Island. You're probably familiar with a few of them. Today, we're going to be focusing on maybe some of those lesser-known flights, maybe some of those lesser-known people and planes. For example, right over there, that is a Bellario Type 11. That is the first airplane to be imported into the United States. It's the fourth oldest plane in the United States and one of the 10 oldest in the world. Standing next to it is Harriet Quimby, and she flew across the English Channel she was the second woman in the world to get her pilot's license. Incredible stuff. Right over here, this is a Wright Flyer. And next to it is Cal Rogers, the first person to make a transcontinental flight across America. It took him 49 days and 15 crashes. 
And maybe you can see right behind his plane there, that's Teddy Roosevelt, the first American president to fly in an airplane. He didn't do it while he was president. Now, the Hempstead Plains Gallery covers from the first flight over Long Island all the way up to World War I. And that's where we're going to head next. I know we said we were going to World War I. Just a quick pit stop. See, early in aviation on Long Island, there were air meets, there were races, there were people flying higher and farther than they'd ever done before because nobody had ever really flown before. So, you know, it wasn't too high of a bar. But one of the most impactful things that ever happened in that time is encapsulated right here. That is one of the first pieces of air mail ever to be sent. It was flown just a few miles, dropped off in Mineola, literally dropped off. Earl Ovington, the pilot, threw the sack of mail over the side of the plane and it burst on the ground all over. The postmaster wasn't happy. But that first bit of air mail delivered back in the early 1900s has evolved into this worldwide delivery system that we know today. It all started here. Not even 10 years after the first flight over Long Island, airplanes were already being used as an instrument of war. World War I was the first time airplanes were used in a wartime environment. Now, the Cradle of Aviation's collection really, really shines from that Blario, but especially through the World War I gallery, because we have some incredible, incredible artifacts here. In fact, right above me, it's a trainer aircraft, a Curtis JN-4, affectionately known as a Jenny. This is a two-seater, and these would be seen up in the sky over Long Island as new pilots trained to fly for the war in Europe. This particular Jenny, however, after the war was done, was bought by a young man. He was a barnstormer. That's an aerial acrobat. He was an airmail, airmail pilot, and yada, 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 he ended up flying across the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, he's more famous for another airplane, the Spirit of St. Louis. But before he flew that, Charles Lindbergh flew this exact plane. And that was verified by Charles Lindbergh himself. In fact, he carved his initials into a piece of the plane. And we have that artifact right over here. Let's take a look. C-A-L, Charles Augustus Lindbergh. He carved it himself on one of the ring ribs of his airplane. And up here? There's a picture of Charles Lindbergh looking at this plane when it was being restored back in 1974. This gallery is incredible. And one of my favorite airplanes in this whole museum is this one over here. It's the only one of its kind. It was built in Farming, at Farmingdale by a company called Breeze. Its name is the Penguin. And it was modeled over that Blair, uh, it was modeled, I'm sorry, off of that Blario airplane that we talked about just before. But it was given an underpowered engine and short stubby wings, so it couldn't fly. It was a ground-based trainer. Because if you're learning how to fly for the first time up in the sky, things can turn real crashy real quick. So this helped pilots get used to the feel of an airplane before they actually took flight. Here we are in our World War I hangar. And we were trying to decide which artifact we should show you, but it's such a difficult decision because there's so much in here. If you want to find out who Roosevelt Field is named after, you can find that information here. And it's not who you think it is, unless you think it is who I think it is, which is who it is. But that's not it. We have wing interactive, so you can see how wings are built. We have a rotary engine here that you can spin. It's a rotary engine. Don't come at me with that radial stuff, OK? We have so much stuff in here. We have a skinless JN4, a skinless Jenny, that allows us to show students who come in here how airplanes work, how the control systems control the control surfaces. There's so much here, and it's all sanitized every hour. The Morse Scout was the first fighter airplane to be based on Long Island. Now, did you ever wonder, when you were watching old movies, where they're flying these old airplanes and they're firing the guns through the propellers. You ever wonder, why aren't they shooting off the propellers? This is why. As the engine spins, there's a little cam on the back there, a little piece of metal, and it has a bump in it. That bump 
trips a series of levers and hinges, and it actually turns off the gun in time with the propeller going in front of it. And now you know why they didn't shoot off their propellers. Hmm. After World War I, Long Island became the epicenter of flight all around the world. So many flights took off from the airfields and airports on Long Island that it became known as the Cradle of Aviation. In fact, one of the most famous flights that took off from Long Island, well, is in a plane that looked just like that. Now, the actual spirit of St. Louis is down in Washington, D.C. And people say, oh, that means that this is a replica. And the answer is, no, 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 no. That's not a replica. This plane was built a long time ago, late 1920s. It is the sister plane of the spirit of St. Louis. In fact, if you're a Jimmy Stewart fan, you might have seen it in the movie, The Spirit of St. Louis. That's the actual plane from that movie. Now, Charles Lindbergh's nonstop flight across the Atlantic Ocean made people think, hey, maybe airplanes aren't just for daredevils, aren't just for instruments of war. Maybe there's something to these airplanes. Maybe we can use them just to ferry people from place to place much more quickly. And that gave rise to airplanes like the Grumman Goose back there. That would ferry people from eastern Long Island to New York City. In fact, it's the forerunner of today's corporate jets. And that one was also featured in a show, a television show, called Tales of the Golden Monkey. If you know that one, I'll be impressed. Aviation on Long Island is more than Lindbergh. In fact, this gallery, the Golden Age, is filled with seminal flights that took off from this area. One I'd like to point out, though, is this airplane here, this model. It's a model of the America, and it was flown by Admiral Byrd. You might have heard his name before. He was also trying to make that flight from New York to Paris that Lindbergh ended up making. He rented out Roosevelt Field, graded it nice and smooth, and his airplane ended up not being able to fly. And he actually let Lindbergh fly from there instead losing the prize, but advancing aviation. And that's really the point of this gallery. The innovations that were made, the feats that were attempted. You had people making altitude records. They weren't trying to go anywhere except beyond the boundary of what was possible. And all of that happened here in New York on Long Island. This is the flight suit of Eleanor Smith. She was born in Freeport. She got her pilot's license at 16. And at 17, she went on a bit of a joyride. She flew under all four bridges that connect Manhattan to Long Island. Now that little stunt got her license suspended for 10 days. But in her notice of suspension in that envelope, there was also a note asking for her autograph. She went on to set altitude records, endurance records. Uh, she was voted best female pilot in 1930. But it wasn't until 1934 that she received the greatest honor any American could ever hope for. They put her on the Wheaties box. When the United States shifted to a war footing because of World War II, Long Island was ready to meet the demands. Grumman and Beth Page built these planes over here. This is an incredible collection of aircraft. Not only do you have the TBM Avenger, a torpedo bomber from World War II, you also have back here the Hellcat, which turned the tide in the Pacific. And up there, the Wildcat, a fighter plane that came before the Hellcat that held the line in the Pacific until the United States was able to take the offensive. Odd note, that airplane, spent about 45 years at the bottom of Lake Michigan until we went down there and fished it out. I mean, I didn't do it, but Cradle of Aviation did. In all, about 100,000 Long Islanders went into the factories to build thousands upon thousands of airplanes. And many of them were women who, for the first time, were leaving their home to join the workforce. Collectively, we call them Rosies, named after Rosie the Riveter the iconic female worker during World War II. 
Now here we have some Rosies working on some actual equipment from the Grumman factories during World War II. But they didn't just work at Grumman. Now, they also worked in Farmingdale at the Republic Aircraft Corporation, building these, the P-47. 15,000 of these things were built, more than any other fighter aircraft during World War II. And this is the last one. Now, P-47s were also used for a short time by the Tuskegee Airmen. And this plane here, the P-47, well, it was the first time they painted their iconic red tail on an aircraft. Now, if you look just above the P-47, up there in the rafters, it's kind of dark, which I guess is kind of the point because these things didn't want to be seen. You have a Waco glider. These things were so important during the D-Day invasions. They would be towed behind cargo planes, released, and they would land behind enemy lines where troops could exit it. Or even jeeps could be stowed inside of there and they could exit it. So we have all of this stuff that was built on Long Island. Grumman and Beth Page, Republic in Farmingdale, the Waco gliders built in Mineola in Queens. Uh, we have the ball turret that was used in the B-17 bombers back there. All of this stuff being built for the war effort on Long Island. So you had the men fighting over in Europe in the Pacific. Here on the home front, you had women in the factories building these machines of war. But that wasn't all that was going on here. You had scrap drives, rubber drives, where kids, school kids, would be collecting scrap metal and rubber to donate to the war effort. You also have women's auxiliary units. We have some of those uniforms down there. You have toys from this era. Our home front collection is expansive and thorough here at the cradle. Now, atomic weapons were not born on Long Island, but Albert Einstein wrote a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1939 saying that the Germans were developing atomic weapons and that the United States should too. Well, he wrote that letter from Peconic right here on Long Island. Now, atomic weapons did end the war very quickly. And the GIs came home, and there were programs set up to purchase houses, and suburbia was born. The middle class was growing. At the same time as World War II was ending, the jet age was beginning. And these all combined to make the world a much smaller place. The 1920s and 30s may have been the golden age of flight, yeah. But the 1950s and 60s, they were the golden age of commercial flight. Flying was glamorous. Pilots, they were, they were like rock stars. Every seat was first class. You got a bed when you were flying across the Atlantic Ocean. The best food. And of course, flight entered pop culture in a big way. You know you made it big when they make a Barbie out of you. As the world transitioned from propeller-driven airplanes to jet airplanes, Long Island was leading the way. And it was Grumman and Republic that were doing it. Right behind me are two examples. Here, we have a Grumman Cougar an early swept wing design for an airplane. By having wings sweeping back like this, you are able to travel at faster speeds. Over there is an early Republic jet plane. It was actually built on a contract from World War II. During World War II, airplanes were called P for pursuit. Afterwards, later contracts, they were called F for fighter. So even, this, even though this plane was built after World War II, it was built on a World War II contract. So it's called a P-84. That is too much information. Our curator, Joshua Stoff, he likes to say that the history of Republic is the history of aviation. And, you know, it's, it's true. It was an incredible company. And it doesn't get as much press maybe today as some others. But they built drones. They built uh, some of the earliest cruise missiles. They built the largest single-seat fighter ever. They built early jets, X-planes, and of course, probably their most famous airplane of all, the A-10, the Thunderbolt II. It was affectionately called the Warthog because of its rugged good looks. Do you remember before how I said the advent of the jet engine made the world smaller? Well, this case here proves it. These are airplanes that are flying over New York 
made by all different companies from all over the world. But these planes are originating from Australia, Japan, Korea, Europe, Africa, all over the place. These planes prove that the world has gotten smaller. And they also make the skies over New York the busiest on the planet. So think about it. Humanity had dreamed of flying for millennia. We finally get there in 1903. By the time 1957 rolls around, humanity had launched its first satellite into orbit around the Earth. And the world had its eyes on the moon. Now, bigger rockets, more powerful rockets, had to be developed to lift people off of the moon, to orbit around the Earth, and ultimately travel to our closest celestial neighbor. And when it, tamed, when it came time to cross that finish line in the space race, once again, Long Island was there to lead the way. Right now, we're in a mock-up of a grumming clean room. And behind me is LTA-1, a prototype lunar module. It was used for testing, pressure testing, electrical testing, vibration testing. They tested on this thing to make sure that the lunar modules that actually went to the moon were able to get their astronauts there safely and home safely, because that's the job. Now, in World War II, Grumman was famous for its assembly line, churning out hundreds of airplanes every day. That wasn't going to work with the lunar modules. They had to be built one at a time by hand. Eight thousand workers at Grumman were dedicated to building these things. What I love most about artifacts like this is that it illustrates the humanity that's behind the hardware that you see out on the museum floor. It was our neighbors that were building these things. My across the street neighbor worked on the propulsion systems for lunar modules. And the lunar modules when they were built, well, People signed these things, these prints here, to let the world know, hey, I did this. I was a part of that. And we get calls all the time from people saying, hey, my, my, my grandfather, my uncle worked on the lunar modules. I'd like to see if I can find their signature on one of these. I haven't found the, my neighbor yet, but I'm still looking. When a lunar module went to the moon, it didn't come home. The bottom half stayed on the moon. The top half detached, went back up to the spacecraft orbiting around, and then they let it go. It either crashed back into the moon, uh, went through the Earth's atmosphere in one case, or it's still out there orbiting around the sun. What that means is lunar modules on Earth, the real thing, are really rare. In fact, there are only three of them in existence. Three lunar modules that were meant to go to the moon. One is at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. One is down at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And the third is right over there. I want to be as clear as I can. That is not a replica. That is not a model. That is a lunar module that was scheduled to go to the moon on the Apollo 19 mission. It was built here in New York on Long Island by New Yorkers. It's an incredible piece of machinery. On Earth, this wouldn't work. The Earth's gravity is too much for its engines. The air on the Earth would be too much for its shape. It's designed to only function in the vacuum of space and in the lunar environment. It is an incredible piece of machinery and a testament to the men and women who worked on it. OK, so that lunar module, that's inspiring. It's incredible. This gets my geek juices going. This is a lunar module simulator. It's the simulator that the astronauts actually use to practice going down to the moon. Neil, buzz. Neil, buzz. They were there. This is the interior of the lunar module. How cool is that? You see the triangular windows there on either side? They had to make them small to save weight. Uh, there's a hatch right there that they would crawl out of to go down to the lunar surface. It is just 
in my opinion, maybe not the coolest thing in the museum, but it is definitely the one that that is like that that little unsung hero. It's one of the coolest pieces in our collection, which is amazing. Uh, Rod, I'm going to ask you actually, would you mind kind of panning over this way? Remember in Apollo 13 where they had to change that carbon dioxide scrubber, that filter, okay, because there were too many of them in the lunar module? Those circular things right there, those are the holes that they had to build, that they had to fit the square peg into. It's right there. It's cool. All right, you've come this far with me. Now, here's a little treat. Something that we don't really talk about a whole lot on tours because it's kind of a small little area of the museum and it's really kind of some small stuff that, you know, large groups can't see. But right there, that model there, that's the design that one Grum in the contract to build the lunar module. You had five legs going all around the descent stage. You had big, huge windows. That, compared to the final design, well, it's pretty incredible, the evolution of the lunar module. And these all came from Grumman. We have one of the biggest Apollo collections you're going to find anywhere. We have lunar module artifacts here. Right down there, that's a piece from Apollo 5, the first time the lunar module went into space, burned up in the atmosphere on the way back. Oh, look, there's a piece of it. We have it right there. There's a fecal containment unit. Yeah. Over here are Apollo 13 armrest, right there. Remember that scene in the movie where Tom Hanks is all like, hey, the Earth is right there. If we thrust and keep it in the middle of the window, we should be good. And then he pulls down that armrest to get ready to do the thrust, to do the burn, sorry. That is an actual armrest from Aquarius, the lunar module from Apollo 13. You know where we're going to find other artifacts from Apollo 13? Nowhere, because it all burned up in the atmosphere. This is an incredible piece of history right here, and it's in New York. When you think space shuttles, Long Island might not be the first thing you think of, but New York had a huge role to play in the space shuttle program. In fact, you might say that we were integral to it because we were part of the space shuttles. All of the wings for all of the space shuttles were built by Grumman. All of the tails of all of the space shuttles were built by Fairchild Republic. But even more than our contribution of hardware, once again, maybe Long Island's greatest contribution are the people. Behind me are the photos of astronauts from Long Island. Ellen Baker from Queens, Mike Massimino from Franklin Square. He was on a TV show for a while. He did all right. He also broke the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, he, he did it on purpose, though. It, it was, he had to rip off a handle to get in to fix something. But he did break it, so another New York first. And then we come to Jasmine Mugbelli from Baldwin, New York, who might be the next woman, the first woman, to walk on the moon. Yeah, Long Island, New York was deeply involved in aviation, space travel, deeply involved in its history. And now, thanks to these fine people, we are sure to be involved in its future. I hope you enjoyed this tour today. Uh, I hope you enjoy all of the other tours that you see. New York is an incredible, incredible place, and we're proud to be New Yorkers. Have a great day.